Welcome back to Geek Skeezers and Googleization, where we're always seeking better ways to challenge the status quo and help create an extraordinary future. I'm Ira Wolf. Today's episode is a special one. Instead of diving into a new conversation, we're going to step into a time machine. Over the past year, in addition to hosting over 100 Geek Skeezers and Googleization shows, I've had an opportunity to be a guest on dozens of other podcasts. Today, we'll revisit one of my favorite guest appearances. It's a chance to echo the insights and inspiration shared there, right here with Googleization Nation. I hope you'll enjoy listening as much as I did sharing my vision for the future of work. You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Hello again, everyone. You're listening to another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I'm your host, Doug Thorpe. Today, we're going to be talking about the future of work. It's a topic you have heard bits and pieces of in past episodes, but uh, my guest today is someone I've known for a number of years. We actually met during the Great uh, Recession in the 08, 09 timeframe. We've stayed in touch and, um, uh, you know, had um, opportunities to share some things over the years. His name is Ira Wolf. Ira, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Doug. It's great to be back with you. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. We how uh, started, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think we did a radio thing uh, back in the day, the, the very first thing we did together, collaborated on. But uh, yeah, so it's a little bit of a custom here, Ira. I asked my guests to share a little bit of their background and journey. And uh, I, I know for those of us that have been around a little longer, that story's long. But uh, g- give us the flyover. How did you get to where you're, you are today? No, I appreciate that. And yeah, as an older baby boomer, there's obviously lot, lots of lessons, lots of stories. Uh, the long and the short of it is, um, I guess the, the biggest surprise that everybody has is I started my career um, you know, almost over 40 years ago as a dentist. Um, I loved everything about dentistry, but dentistry, uh, and uh, which, which means I loved running the business. I loved the entrepreneurship. I liked the marketing, loved working with the pe- patients. I liked working with um, I was involved in the community. I like marketing it. Um, and those were all transferable skills. And, uh, at one, my daughter graduated college, um, in, in June of, or May or June of 1995. And I told my partner that I had brought in that, uh, I was leaving one of us. I was either buying him out or he's selling, or he was buying me out and he could stay. And, uh, I started another business that evolved and everybody assumed it would be consulting with uh, dentists. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, it ended up, I, I ended, I always liked to die problem solving, you know, in business, they call it critical thinking skills. Uh, in healthcare, it's differential diagnosis. So I, I always joke, I said, it, I, I went from having insurance pay my differential diagnosis to uh, being forced to uh, have businesses pay uh, my uh, critical thinking for critical thinking skills. Uh, but I loved the uh, diagnostics and um, I and along the way I was uh, I fell into HR, did uh, pre-employment leadership testing. Um, but my fascination's always been on the future. Uh, we were, I was computerized just to go back. I was computerized in 1987. So we were one of the first uh, I think first hundred practices in the country. Um, I always loved the technology, I always seized upon it. Um, uh, and you know how, and, and, and applied it. Uh, so it was an easy pro- trans, uh, progression. And then through the last 30 years, I've just followed, uh, you know, what the future was going to be, wrote a number of books, sold my company last year, still focused on the future of work, still trying to figure out how can we help people get more comfortable with the change that's coming. And yeah. that's my current passion and pursuit. <clears throat> Uh, that's one of those threads that you and I share. I think we're both early adopters, and it's interesting you pegged 1987. I, I had the same experience. I was running a large administration group at the bank where I worked, and in 1987, our IT guys came around and said, uh, hey, we've got this thing called desktop computing. Are you interested? And I said, absolutely. And um 
I was the first department in the bank to to do a widespread distribution of PCs on the desktop for my team to do their work. And uh, it, it, I've always been an early adopter. And I know the joke is the early guys get the arrows in their back. And I've had a few of those too. But uh, uh, I've always been very enamored with it and tried to be kind of out on the leading edge with it. So um, uh, I get that mindset. And, and that's probably another reason you and I resonate <laughs> with each other. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's funny is just going back and, and, and these are the things that pop into your head. And I'm teaching a class on in innovation and entrepreneurship, realizing that there's, I, I, I made some reference. There's two things I want to I just jot down here. There was, I, I made a reference to something about 9-11 and realized and then I stopped and realized, like, how many of you were around for 9-11? And one hand sort of went up and he goes, I was two weeks old. Yeah. <laughs> so out of 19 students, there was like somebody that was two <clears throat> weeks old. And so a lot of the things of, of when you use a reference and you understand what what when you talk about the future of work, but what the sequence was, what the reference point is, you know, that we think is we're living in the future of work. And everybody who was born in the last 20 years is living in the present. Right. This, right. this, this is, this, this is all they know. But going back to 1987, they, they upgraded me to, they said, if, if you upgrade your hard drive, you'll, you'll be set for life. <laughs> I know where megabytes. you're going with the story. <laughs> 20, 20 megabytes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't do a short reel on, on this thing for 20 megabytes <laughs> right right i know no i had that same experience both with the uh memory in the machines and the in the hard drive size yeah we were yeah, constantly yeah, they upgrading. upgraded me yeah they upgraded me to a 386 computer it just came out yeah it was like state of the art 386 so the the, the uh, workstations were too oh, i know yeah, I know. And and apologies, there's a bunch of people listening to this right now that have no, no idea no what idea. we're talking about. But uh, anyway, suffice it to say, that's uh, part of the future of work is looking at things that are coming. So so let's uh, let's dive straight into that. It, it, can can you summarize what your view of the of the next chapter may look like in, in the work world right now? Yeah, it's terrifying and fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's my tag. One of my taglines up on uh, on uh, LinkedIn for anybody who wants to connect with me, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, yeah, it's it's. I'm obviously we're fascinated by it. This is, you know, we're, we're we geek out about some of the stuff that's coming, but it's equally terrifying. Um, and and you know, to, to may, maybe this this reference will help people. Um, for as fast as things are changing today, as quickly as things, and we talk about VUCA, um, you know, I've been talking about that for, well, since we probably met uh, for, for, for 20 some years. And VUCA is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it was, we won't go into the history of it unless you want to, but, um, you know, most people didn't understand it. It's like, well, that's not for me. We live in a small town America or we're in a small business or, you know, we're 60 years old. That's irrelevant. So people sort of blew off VUCA until February and March of 2020. And then they right. got it. Right. And then it was like, yes, this is what VUCA is. It's volatile. It happens quickly. Where it goes is uncertain. It's really complex and nobody has an answer. <laughs> Uh, and so we're living in this VUCA world that keeps accelerating and people just say, oh, well, we're past the pandemic. We'll, we'll get back to normal. Well, my description of that is never normal. But if we go back to the computer side is we are on the verge of not only this rapid change, but quantum computing. And just and, and just to give people a reference, the fastest computers in the world, and it's about 50 of them called supercomputers, are already um like a hundred million times faster than the what we have as an ordinary laptop so if you have the very very fastest laptop available which most of us don't but if you have the very fast it, it's already um many many times faster than that and and that's important because 
the thing that's holding us up now, the things that's holding up AI and the thing that's holding up many changes is this is is the speed at which they the computers work. They they can't deal with chat GPT. They slow down. So once that floodgate opens up, well, a quantum computer is 178 million times faster than the fastest laptop we have available today. It's 10 times fast. It's 100 times faster than the fastest supercomputers that are available today that are processing all this. Once that happens, it gets more fascinating, more terrifying, because then what's holding us back from, you know, how do we cure cancer? How do we cure Parkinson's disease? How do we get clean water? How do we solve poverty? Um, how do we get a, an apple food supply? Um, how do we do all this stuff is unbelievable. We have a much better quality of life for people and much faster. The problem is it's terrifying because what happens when it gets into the wrong hands? Yeah. And, and there's no guardrails on this. So I know that's a longer answer, but the, yeah, the future of work is fascinating and terrifying. The thing is, we can we have to deal with the terrifying part because the fascinating part, it's not slowing down. There is no way this is the toothpaste is way out of the tube on this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, to your point on what new normal is, if there is such a thing, uh, one never of the normal. things. <laughs> new normal I've, is never normal. <laughs> new normal is different normal, yeah. Um, one of the things that I continually am intrigued by, both curious and, and I guess I could say terrified, as I work with some of my executive coaching clients who have tried to struggle in leadership roles through this pandemic and, 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 and the new work that's going on largely remote for many jobs. Um, and I had a client yesterday, uh, a, a new engagement I just started and we were having our chat and he said, he's still struggling with how to do remote work. And, and here we are, what, three, four years, well, not four, but almost four, almost. uh, post pandemic. His work team is diverse over a large geographic region, and he's not confident he's found the right answer on how to communicate, how to build rapport, how to maintain morale, how to inspire and create accountability. And I'm like, on one hand, my when he said that, to be honest, my first mental reaction, and I did not speak this, I said, Seriously, dude, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you're, yeah. you're, you're that far off on one side of the scale, still concerned about that. <clears throat> and the more I thought about it, you know, I think, I, I think probably he's closer to the truth than anybody wants to admit. I think leaders are still struggling with how to do that well. Oh, absolutely. I spend a lot of time in there because uh, we've, you know, one of my previous co-authored books was, you know, creating a great work a culture in a, in a remote world, in a remote world, um, you know, recruiting in the age of Googleization. The first half of the book was about VUCA. It was about the world that was going to. And, you know, as, as uh, Wayne Gretzky always said, you know, you have to learn how to skate to where the book's going, not where it is. Um, and, and that was, you know, that's what it was. I mean, here's what the world's going to be. How do all these things need to, to change to get there? Um, yeah, people are still struggling, and and but it goes back to this go, goes back to VUCA. It is that going back to our earlier reference? Is do you remember when people said, "I'm going to wait till the computers," you know, to, I, "I'm going to wait until the computers stop changing." <laughs> you know, it was almost yeah. like, as soon as I buy this, it's outdated. And because in six months later, it used to be a year and a half later, or eighteen months later, with Moore's law is like, well, then now there's a newer, faster one. So I'm going to wait until the next one comes out. And then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then people just get left behind. That's sort of where we are now with, um, you know, leadership, the future of work, whether whether it's hybrid, whether it's in person, whether it's uh, 100% remote. It's, we don't know. We don't know what's going to work. Because as people are trying to figure out how to create a remote or hybrid culture, how to hire, the, and they're forced to because you have to hire the best people that aren't always in your backyard where you find the, or, or circumstances force them to move, whatever. 
is while we're still trying to figure that out, there's no definitive plan. There's not, you got to realize just four years ago, 98% of businesses were in person. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden we've got this. So it's a struggle and the technology is improving, but it's changing. It's evolving. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out how to do a two-way screen, you know, basically a two-dimensional screen. But just as I said, with with increased um, computer power, bandwidth, it's not so long that we we were talking about a green, you know, having a green screen or a backdrop before. I will bet you that within five years, that there will may not be you and me, but there will be somebody doing a podcast like this with holograms. Yeah. And you and I will be sitting next to each other with the same backdrop, looking like we're both in the same place. And not everybody's going to have to do that. It'll, it may be 10, 15 or 20 years until that's mainstream. But the reality is it's still going to be evolving. And going back to VUCA, it's very complex, but it's amb ambiguous. There is no definitive right answer. There's not only one answer. There's not only one best practices. What works for you, Doug, may not work for me and doesn't work for our, our, our other friends that, that they all need to modify. And people hate that. They, they want to know if I buy it, if I change it. We don't want to have to change this every year. I got news for you. Whatever policies and procedures you put in place and what works this year may not work next year. Yeah. And it's got to constantly involve. So I think this ambiguity and uncertainty is not the complexity of it. It's the uncertainty and amb ambiguity that people really struggle with. And that's, you know, I'm sure that's what you're working with your coaches. Um, that's what I'm working on. You know, what's, how do we help people become comfortable with being uncomfortable? You know, the interesting thing that I've thought about, and I had my own kind of aha moment recently, because I had gotten kind of zeroed in on the, the work world of the, I, I guess, I hate the term, but I'm going to use it anyway, the so-called white collar versus blue collar environments. And even during COVID, the the blue collar folks were the ones that got dispensation. They had to be boots on the ground. They had to be out on the job site. They had to be out in the plant. They had to be, you know, manufacturing or, or whatever they're doing, constructing, building, repairing. They got dispensation to not have to subject themselves to a lockdown. They were allowed to go out. And my point is this, a lot of this talk about the complexity of leadership in the new, you know, post-pandemic world, actually a lot of it is centered on the, the white collar side of the equation. Why? Because formerly they brought everybody into the office. Everybody had FaceTime. Everybody was used to reporting for work at some prescribed location. But on the blue collar side, they've been out in the field and remote forever. And so Males. if you own I, if you, it drives me crazy, Doug, sorry to interrupt, but it drives me crazy. People say remote won't work. Okay. So for how many decades has your sales force been in the office at a desk? Never. I mean, IBM and Xerox, the, the, the epitome of sales forces for 70 years, 60, 70 years were remote. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, and uh, very similar analogy. And, and that was my point. And, and the reason I had my epiphany, I, I, I spent some time the last couple of weeks uh, with some business owners who happened to be in the trades. One was a large constructor of, uh, you know, commercial space, the giant tilt wall service center type buildings. Um, and as we walked through those properties and I met his foreman and superintendents and such, it, it hit me right between the eyes. It's like, you guys have been doing remote work forever. That's how you do your work. You know, these guys don't go to the office every day and listen to you, the owner, pontificate about policy and vision and direction and all that. You've got a system for communicating and working through things. And yes, it's very project oriented, but isn't all work ultimately, you know? Yeah. 
For sure. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're at a state now where there's certain jobs that people have to go to work. You know, certainly we have manufacturing, much manufacturing, distribution, healthcare, um, hospitality, you know, so they're definitely on site, but that's, you know, that's going to evolve. I mean, there are, there are processes and, and things that can be done even in manufacturing and healthcare, you know, look at health, telehealth struggled for a long time. And, right. and now it doesn't. And uh, there's surgeries that are done remotely. They're not done routinely. Um, well, they are, they're done regularly. I won't say routinely, but uh, a lot of rural areas can't get uh, the health care that they need or a procedure done. So it's not just conversation. They're literally doing procedures remotely. Um, uh, and, it, you know, it certainly can be done, but it takes it, you know, it goes back to the skill set and people getting comfortable with doing that. You know, if you said to a patient, you know, your doctor's in, um, you know, 2000 miles away, they're down in, in, te in, in Texas, um, but he's the best in the world. When do I get to meet him? And he pops up on a screen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's no different than if I was sitting here and my hands were in, you know, a robotic arm. He's just doing it remote. But so uh, that's even going to change. Even 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 those things are going to change. But it goes back to our example of the 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 doctors, the physicians, the welders, the manufacturers growing up in today's world only know today's world it's not futuristic it's the present form right right so what do you tell a business owner or a large organizational i should say leader of a large organizational group what do you tell them when they look ahead and 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 maybe hit that panic button about what's coming or where the, what they see down the road. What, what's your advice? Yeah. Uh, well, one is it is coming. It, you know, or, or as I said, it's here. It depends on your frame of reference uh, where you are. Uh, is, is that change, you know, again, ch change is inevitable. Change is a constant. That's not something new. Nobody came up with that in the 20th, 20th, 21st century. That was Her uh, Hercules. I think it was like 400 B.C., you know, had said that. So it's it, it, it's just happening much faster. Um, and going back to my reference of where we're headed over the next five to 10 years, um, it's even going to be more more so. So the, the good news is, I'd say if we look at it from a good news is, is there is time to make those adjustments. And it's really a mindset. It's really mental adjustments. Um, depending on the industry, depending on the location, um, I wouldn't even say it's so much depending on your age, unless you're in your 70s, um, you know, that you'd have to worry about it. But I think anything else, uh, anybody younger than seven years old has to take into consideration how the world is going to change and how much they have to adapt uh, and put in their common reference. So um, we, I've been working with the model over the last few years. Um, and this just fortuitously came about uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's called the ACE model. Um, and it was done through a lot of research through a couple of corporations, uh, the UN, uh, a couple of universities studied it is what, how, how can you help people and organizations adapt? Sure. And, and they looked at traditional things like what are the skills that we need to develop? And, you know, traditional skills like grit and resilience. Yes, we, 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 we understand that, but grit resilience doesn't help you progress. It just, you just you keep going, but sometimes that grittiness and resilience is you, you keep going the way you used to do, and it's you end up on the wrong mountaintop <laughs> or, or the wrong direction. Um, I, I just wrote an article. I have a newsletter, a little bit about neuroscience, about our brains, and and uh, you know was was about uh, you know the how many how many managers, how many people have you heard? Well, this is the, always all the always the way. We did things around here, or I've done this for 30 years and it's always worked until it doesn't, <laughs> you know, the yogi right. bear, you know, until right. it doesn't. so it looked at growth mindset. It's, it's, you know, that's, that's my thing. I, I, I don't see how anything changes without growth mindset. So whether it's coaches, how do you work with organizations? How do you get to frontline people? How do you get people to think about things differently? Um, and 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 not just because we've done it this way or because we're really smart or have all these degrees. 
is what what do we need to do differently? We're going to make a few mistakes. We're going to learn from the mistakes and we're going to move on. Is is that growth mindset is so critically important because even with grit, you can be gritty, but if you don't know how to change, you're uncomfortable changing direction, You the growth mindset helps. Resilience, it helps you get back, bounce back and keep moving forward. In the right direct, to move in the right direction though, you need a growth mindset. In order to do that, we need a we we need something that's really interesting. We keep talking about learning, learning new skills, reskilling, upskilling, but we also learn how to de-skill and unlearn. And it's not technically proper because we we can't do a brain dump. There's no press and delete button in our brain. <laughs> uh, but that unlearning part is how do we train ourselves? to do a new activity? How do we train ourselves to work remotely? How do we train ourselves to be more comfortable in front of a screen rather than physically in front of a person? How do we learn to do that? It's a combination of learning new skills, but unlearning what made it comfortable before. Because what you hear is, well, you can't collect, how many times have you you've heard this in this remote work world? Is collaborations really, really hard remotely? Oh, and yeah. That, that, that's the common justification for why bosses want people back at the office. And it's not. It means it's hard for them to understand how to do it. It's exactly. not hard for the people doing it because the people exactly. doing it are more productive. They're getting more done. And there's hugely successful people that are doing it remotely. Their collaboration is sky high. And then the, the, the other point is, yes, you may be in the office collaboratively, and working together, and maybe it works, but what's the engagement level? How many people get frustrated with that? How many how many people choose not to be in that, and now you lose good talent? So the unlearning part is like super critical, but you can't unlearn if you don't have a growth mindset, and and if you just have a growth mindset and unlearning, you have can't you, you still need grit because you're going to make mistakes and you got to keep going, and you're going to have failures and you got to bounce back. Uh, and then the last one's just mental flexibility, and that's what we've been talking about. We're probably blowing people's minds here today. Uh, so anybody who was anxious before is probably completely stressed out about what the future is <laughs> going to be. Uh, but yeah. it was mental flexibility, um, and mental flexibility doesn't just mean an open mind. It means uh, my my example is turn on CNN and MS or, or MSNBC and Fox News at the same time, and listen to and and, and don't make judgment. Step back and say, I'm looking from 30,000 square feet, and this is what they're saying. This is what's going on. How do I deal with it? Um, having two disparate, you know, conflicting thoughts going on in your head at the same time, because that's the same way. It's like, oh, I just listened to somebody, and they said, everybody's coming back. If you listen to Elon Musk, everybody's coming back to work, and Jamie Dimon, everybody's going to be back in the office in three years. And then you turn turn your head and turn the dial a little bit, and it's like, no way. 60% right. of everybody will be remote. How do we make sense of this as a leader? And it's that ambiguity. And it's like, okay, what works for us? How do we, it, the question is, how do we make this work for us in the future? Not today. Because what works today is not going to work in two or three years. Uh, we may, you know, I'm sure we'll handle a pandemic differently. We may have a, a pandemic, but we may have terrorism. We may have climate change, aspect. there's going to be constant things that we're going to have to deal with. So how do we deal with this in the future? Is I, for people that are just saying, well, you know, I'm thinking of selling the business in five years, or I heard somebody tell me the other day, I only have 12 more years to retirement. <laughs> wow. It's like, I, you know, it just blows my mind. And I don't have an easy answer or that and to be really snarky but sometimes you just got to walk away yeah yeah you just, you just have to you know walk the, away. The, the, enough people that they want to change the thing that strikes me in all that is if 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 you're owning a business right now and hearing all this thinking about all this what comes to my mind is the idea the the number one solution is to recruit for train up and have a big element of your culture be about the whole idea of adaptability 
And you want to bring people in that have a personality that is adaptable, willing to embrace change, willing to, you know, move forward if the situation requires it. Now, the other extreme of that, you you can't be one of these visionary business owners that are chasing bright, shiny objects every day. You know, it's, oh, new initiative here, new initiative there. Let's go here. Let's go there. That drives people nuts. But if you... If you know your market, your industry is going to be subject to some of this volatility, you got to start today building a culture that embraces change and has a process to get everybody informed and prepared and ready to go. I'm so glad you you brought that up because going back to this ACE model, we we went through the five abilities: grit, resilience, growth mindset, mental flexibility, and and unlearning. So those are those are the those are the skills that people need. There's also um, the C is character, and that's personality. Um, so it talks about things like uh, extrovert. You know, people are extroverted or introverted. Uh, people are, are uh, it looks at emotional stability. How are people highly excitable or or more reserved? Um, and, and less anxious, but that doesn't make you good or bad at, at adaptability. It's just knowing oneself. Okay, so the character part will take off the table here today. That's just who people are. There needs to be higher levels of self awareness. They do need these other abilities to adapt, but none of it works in the culture. So when w- what you said is people need to start looking at people that are more adaptable or helping them become more adaptable. You can't do that. It, it's it's not in isolation. In many organizations, they have the right people, but the culture doesn't support them mm-hmm. either. So when in the E part of the ACE, A-C-E, is environment, is it, do the peop, do the employees feel like they have management support, company support? Do they have their team support, which includes their manager? Are there, there's a work environment is a third measure that we look at. Is, are the is the uh, are the processes and policies supportive of that? Emotional health is really a measure of psychological health. Okay, it it's it, it is is it safe to make a mistake? If it's safe to suggest a new idea, is it safe to say I'm struggling? And that's a huge huge issue. And right. then the final one right. is 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 measures the the stress of the job and this impacts it some jobs you just can't change if you're a triage and you're working triage in an emergency room if you're in a 911 contact center um if you're you know a, a first responder um the stress of those jobs is intense versus and i know accountants and engineers will say well my job's stressful too yeah but on a comparative scale on a one to ten scale one's a six and one's a ten yeah. Okay. Um, so it's understanding that. So part of it is it is the invite. We need to be much better at, at an environment, and we we'll, we always can go back to how well has what we've done in the past worked. It's terrible. Employee engagement, according to Gallup, hit its highest record high of thirty three percent of employees are engaged. It means two thirds are not. And that's after four decades of companies trying to create a better culture, a better environment and spending billions and billions of dollars doing this. And it's still only one out of three people are engaged. But when they ask how many people are engaged and thriving. You know, maybe they're engaged at work, but they're the rest of their life sucks. Nine percent. There's only nine percent of the workforce that's both engaged and thriving. Wow. If you now imagine with all this change and all the stress and all the things that we're talking about is if you create a better environment, then you're creating a safe haven. You're creating a place that people want to work, whether it's in person or remote. They want to work for you because you're allowing them to maybe not thrive, but do more than just barely survive. Right. And right. have an existence. So if, if you can even be mediocre at engagement and mediocre at helping people th- have, have a, a life and treating them with respect you got it made 
Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And, and that's and that's ultimately the message. And that's, you know, really what I'm working on now. It's like, how do you help create that? And people have all these gimmicks and and, you know, perks and things that they're doing and, you know, four day work weeks. And it doesn't matter if you don't have a supportive culture. And and measure those four, you know, at least the things you can control, what you can control is you can control how well you're perceived by your company, by by your employees, how well the managers perceive, which is usually the number one fault, and and the coworkers, and do you have the right policies and you know in in place, and is it a, is is it psychological, is, is it safe to say yeah. I'm struggling? Is it safe to try to innovate to try new things? You can have, you can score hundreds on all the abilities. Right. You, you, right. you can literally ace it, your yeah. hiring process. We got all the right people and it's still not working. Yeah. 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 It's the environment. Well, Ira, we have uh, run out of time, my friend. This has been amazing. And uh, I've had certainly my own fun uh, listening and, and uh, paying attention here. Tell folks the best way to get a hold of you if they're interested in learning more. Um, you can probably just Google me. So it's Ira or Ira S, which just stands for Stephen. So to differentiate me. Um, but you can, uh, I'm very, very active on LinkedIn. Uh, please connect, reach out, connect with me. Say you heard me, heard, heard about me on the show. Um, but you can go to irawolf.com as well. And uh, you can also go to adaptabilitytoolkit.com to learn about some of the tools that we talked about today. Awesome. Well, as always, folks, we're going to have that info in the show notes and you can uh, click the links there. But one last time, Ira, thanks for sitting in. It's a pleasure to reconnect and get you here to share all this. It, it's always a pleasure, Doug. Appreciate it. Hopefully we, it won't take us another 15 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Well, with that, folks, we're going to bring this to a close. Thank you for investing your time to uh, sit in with us. And we certainly hope this has been helpful. If you uh, want to check it out, we do have a video version of this show over on YouTube, channel by the same name, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Hop over there, look at the video archive. Also, more link info and details you can uh, leverage and get access to. But for now, we're going to sign off, say goodbye, go out there, make it a great day. Thanks for watching Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Be sure to listen to the podcast and follow us on YouTube.